This is KPD News Conversations. I'm Sarah Colvin. Pleased to welcome back in the studio for a monthly update, State Representative Tim Whalen, representing the 1st Barnstable District. Rep Whalen, Tim, thank you so much for it's coming back. It's a pleasure to be back, Sarah. Thank you so much. It's great to get uh, come down here, talk with you, close friend, um, talk about the issues of the day and get some information out to our voters, out to our residents here on Cape Cod, and let them know what's going on Beacon Hill. I relish the opportunity. I thank you. Thank you. It's important uh, for me and important for us uh, to, yep. to help uh, get that word out. So uh, I understand uh, after we're done taping this, you're heading up to Boston uh, to the State House to do some work with uh, fellow State Representative uh, Will Crocker. First of all, I want to congratulate you and Will both on having perfect mm -hmm. voting records. That's fantastic. I don't hear that uh, quite often, so congratulations for that. It's not always easy to get up to Boston. It's uh, probably the first time in my life that I've had a perfect attendance record. If you go back to <laughs> uh, fifth grade and ask Sister Mary Lou, she would tell you that I may have had a few attendance issues back then. But evidently, I have since found my way, and yes, I'm very grateful um, that uh, I have the opportunity to represent folks here in the first Barnstable, and um, part of that is showing up every day to make sure that I vote um, for their best interests. Wonderful. Well, you can send those news clippings to Sister Mary Lou, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what you're working on uh, up at the State House today. Sure. We have a bill that um, uh, Rep. Crocker and I jointly filed, and this, this was, uh, it's one of these conundrums that we deal with sometimes legislatively and I was able to identify the issue right away and after a conversation with um, Chief of Police uh, from Yarmouth Frank Fredrickson and it, it, it's a law enforcement related issue surprise surprise a lot of what I do tends to be law enforcement related I suppose because of my career and my history and my uh, uh, supposed expertise in the area so what this issue relates to is it relates to a police department's ability to share information gathered from a call, responding to a call, with DCF. And I'll fall back to and explain when I was young and I was on the state police and I was working in the western part of the state, I would respond to calls, um, unfortunately too frequently, um, involving uh, uh, domestic violence or uh, domestic disturbance, an argument. And when I would respond, you would find that uh, you would have uh, the two participants um, and then there were children involved. Mm. The children, sometimes you, we would make observations that they were living in squalor, they weren't being cared for, they looked malnourished, the living conditions they were in, they were in unheated homes. We had a baby that was uh, sleeping in a uh, bureau dresser. Oh my goodness. Uh, animals living in the, uh, on the property, very unsanitary conditions, it was just dangerous, dangerous conditions for the children. Back then, we would notify DYS, which was the precursor to DCF, and they would come and they would take action, they'd investigate, and they were always interested in the, uh, they were always looking out for the best interests of the children. So, with that in mind, in 2014, prior to my entering the legislature, in a very rightly directed attempt, with the best of intentions, the legislature made some amendments to the availability of information that would be shared by police departments as it relates to calls that they responded to involving domestic violence, Chapter 209A violations um, and complaints and the like. And they did this very rightly so with the interest of protecting the information of victims. Also to make sure that victims did not hesitate to call for help because they, were, they would be fearful that their name or some, you know, some identifying information would end up in the newspaper and they would be embarrassed in their community. As sad as it is, that's the reality that many of these poor victims of domestic violence deal with. In so doing, uh, in so writing this information, uh, I mean, so writing this legislation, what the legislature mistakenly did was they forgot to include in these small, narrow group of uh, organizations or agencies that police departments could share information with from their observations as they respond to these calls. They forgot to include DCF. So they include victim witness advocates, they included district attorney's offices and the like, but they forgot to include DCF. So under current state law, a police officer responds uh, to, a, to a complaint of uh, domestic violence or uh, domestic assault. Police officer makes observations that the children are in, uh, are, are in danger. They're living in, as I mentioned earlier, squalid conditions. They are not being cared for. They really, really need help. Police departments are prohibited from sharing that information with wow. DCF. So once Chief Fredrickson brought this information to my attention, I spoke with Rep. Crocker. Immediately, we jointly filed a bill um, to address this. And all that we're doing in the bill is where they list the organizations, as I mentioned earlier, like district attorney's offices, victim witness advocates, like Jane Doe Incorporated and the like. 
We're also including um, investigators for the Department of Children and Families. Uh, it's a good bill. It's the right bill. It needs to get done. It will protect children. Will signed up with me right away on doing this. So um, he and I are going up to the State House today to testify in front of the Joint Committee on uh, Children, Families, and Persons with Disabilities, which Will sits on that committee. And mm -hmm. we're going to testify along with uh, Deputy Chief Steve Exaros from Yarmouth Police in favor of the bill and um, hopefully get a, um, a favorable report out of committee and get some legs on this bill. And once we address the exigency of this bill with leadership, I have high hopes that we'll be able to get this through and take a positive step forward to protect children. And it's unfortunate how pervasive the issue of domestic violence is uh, here on Cape Cod and really throughout Massachusetts, but I think there are so many people struggling here on Cape. Uh, we have, unfortunately, a large alcoholism problem, which tends to fuel domestic violence on um, lots of folks who are living, um, you know, without the money that they need or in, in inadequate housing or having trouble finding housing, and all of those things kind of fuel those those unfortunate uh, family issues. But so what you're saying right now is, is if, some, if the police are called to a domestic violence incident and you observe uh, children living in squalor or children uh, who might not be treated very well you're not allowed to say anything to DCF um, does it do they have to wait until a person gets charged with a crime of domestic violence and then it, it gets relayed to DCF or is it just something that never gets reported out at all and, until it gets to a and get to a point where it has to be the police department is not allowed to share that information now police officers as much as school teachers and, and, and other people in positions of public trust are mandated reporters under Chapter 51A. However, um, this is a case where that very important information, as it relates to only two calls related to domestic assault under Chapter 265 or violations of restraining order under Chapter 209A, um, they compartmentalize that information only. So if you're caught on a traffic stop, um, doing something with a child, you know, your child in the car, uh, let's say uh, you're drunk driving, mm. you'll be reported to DCF right away. Okay. As, as well you should, because you're putting not only yourself and, and everybody else in the room, but you're putting that child in danger. Of course. As well you should. Take that same child, take that same parent or, um, you know, or caregiver and put them into a, uh, a response call to a domestic issue and People are falling over drunk, and, and the children are maybe um, even more endangered by the circumstances in which the police officers observe. Now those police officers cannot share that information with DCF. <clears throat> and again, we keep referring to up on Beacon Hill, and, and, and I've been in there three years, and I'm, I'm still not thinking like a politician. I still think like a cop, which I think is a good thing. I think so, too. If I, <laughs> if, if I ever start thinking like a politician, then maybe it's time for, for a career change, right? <laughs> um, but... Um, Anyways, we, we refer to it up there as the land of unintended consequences. Mm. The original change in 2014, and again, this predates my period when I was in the legislature, Sarah. Greatest of intentions. We want to ensure that the victims of domestic violence can be assured that their identities will be protected. Absolutely. Without question. But in so doing, uh, they forgot to check off one more box when it comes to agencies that, you know what, we really should make sure DCF knows. And again, this only applies to DCF. It doesn't say DCF and Time Magazine. You know, sure. we're going to put it out there. It doesn't say DCF and the CBS Evening News. This says DCF. And I can tell you, back um, well over a year ago when, God rest her beloved little soul, the Baby Bella case mm. was going on, I was speaking to um, uh, DCF and I was speaking to police agencies because DCF is very strict about releasing any information as well. They should be very strict. The very private information, women and children, um, families, they should be very strict about releasing that information. During the Baby Bella case, police departments were reaching out to DCF to get information. When they put a picture of the baby out there, um, police officers from here in southeastern Massachusetts saw the pictures of that, that beloved little soul and thought, hey, um, that looks like and they would identify the child. So they would go into DCF and saying, can you give us the name or the address for, uh, I'm sorry, they were saying, can you give us the address for the John Jones family? Because that looks just like John Jones's daughter, Macy. Oh my. And DCF wouldn't release the information. And it took an, almost an act of Congress, actually it was an act, through the governor's office. I spoke with the governor's office, they became immediately concerned. 
Um, and then they put me in touch with the commissioner of DCF. And the commissioner of DCF, as it relates to the Baby Bella case, allowed the sharing of information with police departments as it pertained to looking, um, working on the Baby Bella case. So the point in all that, what I'm, uh, I guess what I'm trying to get across, Sarah, is that DCF, um, they are a, like basically a bear trap for information as well. Information goes in. It's like the Roach Motel. Information <laughs> goes in, but it doesn't come out. Right, absolutely. Um, and again, as it should be. As it should be. So for police departments to share information with DCF, DCF are very fine stewards of, of, of keeping information private. So I don't think that this, in, that this will put anybody in any danger, and it will enhance the safety of children. Absolutely, and, and does, I would assume that DCF is on board with this as well. They would like to have that information uh, as, as soon as possible. I, can't under, I, I couldn't imagine any reason why they wouldn't like to have that information. They're committed to looking after our children and protecting them. Absolutely, and I think uh, certainly a, a challenge, I think, with any domestic uh, domestic abuse and domestic violence case, I think that there are women and men uh, who are afraid of coming forward, who are afraid of saying something because they're under the thumb of that abuser, under the thumb of, of you know, a fear of that. So any protections or provisions that can be in place to ensure that they remain safe and their children remain safe um, is certainly important. The tough thing about this is there, there will undoubtedly be some pushback. Um, there always is. There's no... There, there, I mean, you could give out free $10 bills on a street corner, and there's going to be pushback that they're not $20 bills. Um, but we have to listen to the concerns of anybody that, that, that would ob uh, object to this. And, and, and I hear it, and I understand that there may be some concerns that um, a victim would not call a police department for fear that DCF would be notified. Mm. So that puts us in a position where we have to choose between protecting the victim or protecting the child or children on the scene. And I think that I'm not going to be the one to decide because we should be protecting both of them. But right now, we're not protecting the children at all when the police respond. And, and it's very frustrating f for the officer when they respond on scene and they put all this information in a police report and none of it can be shared. I mean, facts are facts. If the children are living in a home with animal feces on the floor and it's 50 degrees, someone should know about this. Right. Absolutely. And we should get help. We should get even more help, more assistance for that victim to help make sure that we put them in a better place, that they can better look after their family. That's our responsibility as a society. So I fully stand behind that. But it will be interesting as this debate goes forward to see and to hear from people on the other side. And I'm all ears. I'll always listen to someone um, that has an opinion um, different than mine uh, because... As my mother told me, God gave me two ears and one mouth for a reason. Absolutely. So yeah. uh, UN Rep Crocker heading up to the State House uh, today to testify. Uh, where are we in terms of the process of that bill testifying? And then there's, there's, there's much more work left to be done on this before we see it um, right. going up for a vote. So I, I will be speaking um, over the next couple of weeks with uh, Chairwoman <clears throat> Denise Garlick who is the uh, uh, House Chair of that committee. And she and I have a, have a great relationship. I, I talk with her all the time. She's a close friend. and. Uh, I'll talk with her about seeing what the possibility is of getting this bill moved as an independent piece or if they have a, a design for an omnibus piece of legislation that they could tuck it into. Um, and also I want to find out from her if she's heard any pushback on it and hear what the concerns are of any you know, individuals or groups that, that might have concerns with it. Maybe see if I can speak with them and allay some of those concerns and let them understand where we're coming from on this and, and, and try and reach consensus. I mean, the idea is going forward in the legislative process is not to ram stuff through, but try to bring everybody together mm. and, and, and get everybody on the same page. Absolutely. So shifting focus uh, to finance, uh, I sure. know there's another uh, another thing that you're, well, there's many things that you're working on, but in terms of uh, your involvement with the Ways and Means Committee, tell me a little bit about what's going on uh, there in terms of the budget process. Sure. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow we have a uh, meeting of the uh, uh, House Committee on Ways and Means. It's going to be uh, at the State House, as most, if not all, of our meetings are. And it's going to be a consensus revenue hearing. We're going to um, have the great opportunity to have representatives from the uh, executive office, admin and finance, uh, Department of Revenue. And they're going to come in and they're going to discuss with us what their projections are for uh, tax revenues in the upcoming FY19 window. And this is, a, uh, this is an annual event every December because right now the governor's office is working on their budget, their FY19 budget, which will be released in early January. Once the governor's budget is released, we will have time to sit back and digest it, and then the House takes it up in April, <clears throat> the last week of April. Um, we, we'll, we'll take it up, and then it's a couple weeks after us that the Senate takes it up. So 
This is the first step in the process. Uh, since I was recently appointed to House Ways and Means, it was a decision that was kind of made as a group with the Cape and Islands delegation. We get together, all eight of us, and um, I was kind of the chosen person to go forward and ask to be assigned to Ways and Means so we have someone assigned, because this committee is very important. It handles all the spending in the state. Over $40 billion comes through House Ways and Means. Huge. And we want Huge. And, and, and we wanted to have a voice for the Cape and Islands on there. And I'm very happy to have been selected by my colleagues to step forward and be that voice and to have been selected um, ultimately by um, House Minority Leader Brad Jones and assigned to that committee. So this is the first step in the process. It'll be followed by we're going to have a series of committee hearings that will be coming up in the spring. Uh, we go on a little traveling road show. I did it last year, too, and we'll have regional meetings. I'm going to see if, if we can arrange to have one down here, um, if not on the, the Cape, to at least get one somewhere deep down here into southeastern Massachusetts, <clears throat> which we didn't get last year. But we went to uh, from Amherst to um, Beverly uh, and, and, and everywhere in between. We did North Worcester County, Essex County, a uh, lot we did in Boston. And we'll meet with different groups over the course of the spring, different state agencies that will come in and talk about their, budge, their budget priorities mm -hmm. and what their requests are. And then we'll get together as a committee and we'll come up, with, as I was mentioning, we'll release the House uh, version of the budget in early April. And that'll give the members the opportunity to um, digest it and consider and propose amendments to the budget so that we can jump right into work during that last week of April. Great. Well, I'd love to see uh, a meeting uh, come down here on Cape. Of course, I know that our tourism dollar is important, our social services dollars are important, uh, our economic development dollars are important. Absolutely. So anything that you can do to make sure that our Cape Cod voice sure. is heard loud and clear up there, uh, I can tell you, Sarah, that. With, uh, without question, the Baker Polito administration have been fantastic. I just announced last week there was $850,000 around, around $850,000 in state grants that came down just to my district between Yarmouth and um, Brewster. It was an awful lot of money that came down into the district. And it's just been, they, they've been fantastic reaching out to the various uh, secretaries, Secretary Ash, Secretary Beaton, for instance, and speaking, uh, advocating for the municipalities with their grant applications that they put forward. They've been great. We've, we've been very fortunate down here on the Cape because of their commitment to the Cape and the Islands. Absolutely. I attended an announcement, Secretary Beaton, uh, when it was still warm outside. Uh, nice, some coastal resiliency uh, erosion grants. Uh, that was so it's great to, to see that money coming. And of course, uh, the rail trail uh, getting some funding from the state as well. $325,000 so. to the town of Brewster just last week. And um, continued commitment going forward because that, um, that spur they're going to put on the rail trail going up to Crosby Landing, mm. not only is it going to be fantastic, but it's not going to be cheap. And we got it. That's fantastic. And we got it. That's Secretary Beaton and Secretary Ash. It's been fantastic as well. I tell you, Baker Polito administration knew what they do, um, knew what they were doing when they hired these people. Great. Well, Rep. Whalen, I thank you so much. And again, if our, our viewers want to get in touch with you, if they have questions, if they want to learn more, if they have uh, some things they want to say to you, what's the sure. best way for them to get in touch? Uh, the telephone number to the office is 617-722-2014. Um, they'd be speaking to my chief of staff, Rebecca Hamlin, who is top-notch awesome the best and um, also my email is timothy dot whalen w-h-e-l-a-n at m-a house dot g-o-v and uh, I get sometimes five or six hundred emails a day oh my so yes and when budget <laughs> season comes around it, it'll be even more than that so I can't respond to each and every email but I do my very best just it's, it's a matter with the volume I could spend literally all day responding to email but I make a point of trying to read each and every email so that I, I have the best view of what's going on in the district and what the concerns are for the people I represent. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming in. We'll thank talk you. with you again next month. Have awesome. a great day and happy holidays. The best to you, too. Thank you. Thank you so much. My guest today, uh, State Representative uh, Tim Whalen, of course, representing the 1st Barnstable District in the House of Representatives for Cape Media News. I'm Sarah Colvin.